بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد We reach poem number 58 of this blessed composition the Qasida Burda Sallam al Busiri he says in the next poems he says لا طيب يعدل تربا ضم أعظمه طوبى لمنتشق منه وملتثم أبان مولده عن طيب عنصره يا طيب مبتدأ منه ومختتم يوم تفرس فيه الفرس أنهم قد أنذروا بحلول البؤس والنقم وبات إيوان كسرى وهو منصدع كشمل أصحاب كسرى غير ملتئم والنار خامدة الأنفاس من أسف عليه والنهر ساه العين من سدم وساء ساوة أن غاضت بحيرتها ورد واردها بالغيظ حين ظمي كأن بالنار ما بالماء من بلل حزنا وبالماء ما بالنار من ضرم والجن تهتف والأنوار ساطعة والحق يظهر من معنى ومن كلمي عموا وصموا فإعلان البشائر لم تسمع وباء وبارقه الإنذار لم تشمي من بعد ما أخبر الأقوام كاهنهم بأن دينهم المعوج لم يقمي these are the lines there's one poem left from the end of the previous section and then we're starting the next section the previous section is still about his status that's what we've been speaking about until now his high status and that's what Allah Abu Siri was describing the status of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so in that one he says no perfume can rival the earth that holds his bones Blessed are they that breathe its fragrance or kiss it. So this one is still about him. There was one thing left after speaking about his status and everything else. There was something left about his scent, which in the Shamail we discussed in detail. Then the next section is about the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, the Mawlid. So in there he says, His birth revealed the purity of his ancestry. How fine his origin, how pure his final end. And then he continues to then show what happened when he was born around the world, the changes that occurred. So he says, that day the Persians sensed that they had been warned of the descent of defeats and retribution. Because with the coming of Rasulullah wasallam, that signaled their end, which then happened very soon after the Prophet ﷺ passed away, but it started during his lifetime. By night, the arch of Kisra split asunder. Likewise, his hoard never to be restored. This Iwan of Kisra, this was the superpower of the world. The Romans were nothing compared to it. And there's nothing left of this. Even these cities where this was, the arch of Kisra in Madain, Tesifan, which was called at that time, there's just a few ruins left now. The, this arch of Kisra, it's the ruins of that are left, and that's about it. The sacred fire breathed its last from sorrow. You know, they had a fire that was going for a hundred, for a thousand years. They used to constantly manage it, 24 hours, to make sure that it never was extinguished. The sacred fire breathed its last from sorrow. Out of anxiety, the Euphrates lost its way. Sawa endured the drying of its lake. The thirsty who sought water there returned in rage. That lake dried up. As though fire itself from grief was as wet as water, while water blazed like fire. This is proper poetry. And then he says, Jinn called out, the jinn. They called out, lights shone dazzling. Truth was made manifest in word and in fact. 
Blind and deaf were they, so the good news announced went unheard, while the lightning flash of warnings went unseen. This even though the diviners had advised their people, the fortune tellers, those who used to tell fortunes in those days, they're called diviners. The, this even though the diviners had advised their people that their crooked religion could no longer stand. And even though their eyes beheld on the horizon great meteors falling as idols toppled on earth, until sent flying from Revelation's road, demons fled after those who were overthrown. So this is all a description of his birth. We'll be looking at some of this today. Uh, another poet, Aisha al Baruniya, she says, "If your hopes are set up, set, if your hopes are set upon ascent and openness to God's ascent." Then cling to Ahmed, straying to his scent. Be lost in beauty, well content. What that means is, if you have hopes to also experience a mi'raj and to go to the heights, the spiritual heights for us, we won't go physically, but spiritual heights. And if your eyes are set on opening up to Allah's acceptance of you, Allah's ascent, his acceptance of you, then cling on to Ahmed. Ahmad is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Cling on to Ahmad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Straying in his scent, enjoying his perfume. I mean, enjoying his perfume means all the nur that he has radiated, all the hidayat that he has spread. This is his perfume. Because hidayat is perfume. Be lost in beauty, well content. Sulaiman Shalabi. He says, Lady Amina, Muhammad's mother she, from this shell you pearl did come to be. So basically from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa came from Amina. And then Rumi says, Unbelief donned the blackest of co coats, wear the blackest of your coats, unbelief, kufr. So he's addressing kufr, O kufr, wear the blackest of your coats. The light of Muhammad is come. D the drum of eternity's notes tell that God's shining kingdom is come. Then Sumbul Zad Wahbi says, By exiling offense, you made a Kaaba of the world. Your blessed ad advent toppled Kisra's arch. So this is just really interesting poetry. So the first one, لا طيب يعدل طربا ضم أعظمه طوبا لمنتشق منه وملتثم. So here he says, لا طيب there is no perfume. طيب means perfume. We say إطر, but طيب is fragrance. So there is no fragrance and there is no perfume that is equal to the soil, to the earth that holds, that is next to his bones. Now one mustn't understand from that that he is now bones because we know from the hadith that the earth does not consume the prophets. So they're intact. But this is just an expression. This is the same as that expression in the poem of that desert Arab which Imam Nawi relates that he came to he were, Imam Nawi relates from a, one of the narrators who was sitting there in the Masjid al-Nabawi. And he says that this desert Arab came and addressed the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, addressed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, saying, فَطَابَ مِن طِيبِهِنَّ الْقَاءُ وَالْأَكَمُ نَفْسِ الْفِدَاءُ لِقَبْرٍ أَنْتَ سَاكِنُهُ فِيهِ الْعَفَافُ وَفِيهِ الْجُودُ وَالْكَرَمُ That's what he said. Basically he came and he said, يَا خَيْرَ مَنْ دُفِنَتْ فِي الْقَاءِ أَعْظَمُهُ فَطَابَ مِنْ طِيبِهِنَّ الْقَاءُ وَالْأَكَمُ Yes. So he says, O oh, the best who, whose bones are buried. But that's just an expression. When somebody dies, you expect their bones. So that's why he said that. So I remember, it's there. It's, it's written on the pillars there. So he came and he said this poem. The, oh, the best of the ones whose bone is buried in this place and which, yeah, that's why he said, فَطَابَ مِن طِيبِهِنَّ الْقَاعُ وَالْأَكَمُ That by his fragrance, he has fragranced all the surroundings. 
So he's buried there and his fragrance has caused fragrance to emanate from all of its surroundings. And then he says, my nafs, my life is sacrificed for this qabr that you inhabit. In it is chastity. In it is jud, which means generosity and benevolence. So before he said that, he read the verse of the Quran. وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ إِذْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ جَاءُوكَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا اللَّهَ وَاسْتَغْفَرَ لَهُمُ الرَّسُولُ لَوَجَدُوا اللَّهَ تَوَّابًا رَحِيمًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that if they have oppressed themselves and then they come to you, O Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then they seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger seeks forgiveness for them, then they will find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very forgiving. So he comes after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He says that verse first and then he says this poem and then after that he goes away. And the narrator who is sitting there says, I then fell asleep. I fell into a slumber and I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in my dream and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, quickly go and catch up with this desert Arab and tell him Allah has forgiven him. So I woke up, quickly ran outside, found him, and I told him the good news. Imam Nawi has related this in his Kitab al -Adhkar. So these are similar words that Busiri is using as well, by saying that there is no fragrance that can match the fragrance of the earth that surrounds the Prophet ﷺ. Unfortunately, we just can't get close enough. But there are reports from people who have been able to go inside that room inside that enclosure rather, it's an enclosure. You can't see the grave because the grave has a wall around it and then another wall around that. And you can just see that second wall. And there's no entrance except through a small window in the roof, uh, in the dome, there's two domes actually. There's the green dome which we see, which is on top of the second wall. And the inner wall has another dome which we can't see, unless you go up there and look through the, they've only left a small opening, just to the natural, the air, etc. Uh, can go in. So nobody sees his grave. Somebody just told me the other day that my mom, she actually looked inside and she saw the grave. I said, no, what she saw was the wall with a nice tapestry around it, a cover around it. And it looks like a grave because if you look in it, it looks like it's a, one of those big mausoleums, you know, one of those big uh, walled uh, kind of enclosures as you see in other places. But it's a wall inside. And then there's the metal grating around it. That's what we see, the metal. If only they could have just made that metal a bit bigger so people can just see inside and they won't bother. Their, their curiosity will be finished. You know, their curiosity will be quenched because everybody wants to look and they don't let you look in there. So it kind of, it's really strange because when you prevent somebody from something, then they want to do more of it. So if they just kind of make it, made a few bigger holes, holes and you could just look through, okay, khalas, I've seen it. You know. So there's sometimes a green or a reddish, I think, uh, cloth inside that's covering that wall inside. So I told him, I said, well, either your mom definitely, your mom definitely saw that wall or she had some kind of unveiling. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up something special for her. But otherwise, it's not the case. Because when my grandfather first went for hajj, I think the only hajj he did, when he got to the haram and he saw the Kaaba for the first time, he turned around to my father and he said, but doesn't the Kaaba have a cloth on it? So my father said, yes, look, it's got a cloth on it. So then he looked back and yes, it did have a cloth now. So when he first saw it, it seemed like he didn't have a cloth. But these things can happen to different people. But once you reveal them, then they finish. Because these are all personal secrets. So these things can happen anyway. So unfortunately, we can't get access to this. But if you did get access to that, then you'd probably, you'd probably smell it because of the reports that we have from people who have had access to just that close area it's it's just as good anyway alhamdulillah because if you look in the vatican you have the saint peter's cathedral <coughs> where the pope gives his wednesday speech every week 50,000 people come there so in that cathedral there's about 200 of the 270 or 300 popes that have ever lived 200 of them are buried there so some of them there's one of them that i've actually got you can see him through a glass They've covered his face and his body in white, but you can see him. So they've put him on display there. And then there's huge amount of statues and 
it's literally is like uh, what they would say in Urdu, it's like a butkada, an idol house. That's what it is. Gile jafai wafa numa jo haram ko ahle haram se hai. Kisi butkade me jake bayan kare to sanam bhi kahe hari hari. What that means is, this is Allama Iqbal's poetry. He says, this is totally a different topic, but the people of haram, the people that live around the haram, they don't have so much value for the haram. Because they've been living there for such a long time. So they get used to it. So their respect for it doesn't stay the same as somebody who comes there for a while. So he's saying that, Gile jafai wafa numa jo haram ko ahle haram se hai. The complaint that the haram has from the ahlul haram, from the people who live around the sanctity, the sanctuary. If you kisi but kade me jake bayan kare. If you go to some idol house, a temple of idols, and you mention that complaint of the haram ha that the haram has against the people of the haram, then even the idols would start saying hari hari. They would start chanting as well. That's how bad it is. This is this is just poetry. Ajib, it just evokes ajib reactions and emotions. So then, what they have is they have Pope John Paul, the the one who just passed away recently, died recently. He's got him, and then they've got different ones in different areas, and then many of them you can't see because they're down in the crypts. And then people go and they do a bit of worship here, they do a bit of worship there, then here and there. It's just, just very wealthy, systematic kind of worship that they do in these different places. And if a person goes there, he will realize the beauty of Islam. You'll appreciate why we're not allowed to do so many things, because of where it takes you. So we have a total ban on images. No statues, no pictures. This photography has messed things up a bit. But in terms of drawing pictures, creating new images and things like that, there's no such thing in Islam. Despite that, look where the Muslim Ummah is in terms of architecture. Some of the best architecture in the world is the Muslim architecture. That adorns, I mean, the whole of the Indian subcontinent. Despite the fact that the Muslims have always probably been a minority there. You know, how many million in how many million? You know, we're talking about an absolute minority. But yet, the Aside from a few places in, uh, what's that place called, in Jaipur and Udaipur and a few places like that, some, all the other historical architecture is primarily Muslim. Whether you go to Hyderabad or whether you go to Delhi or wherever you go, the majority of it is, is Muslim. The Taj Mahal, wonders of the world. You go to Egypt, it's like that. You go to Istanbul, it's probably one of the best one of the best uh, uh, preservations of that. So, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. So then he says, Tuba li muntashikim minhu wa multathimi. Glad tidings, blessed are they who breathe its fragrance or kiss it. Now this could be either literal or, mani or metaphorical. You, you're never going to be able to you know, kiss that. Uh, because it, you just don't have any access. It's many, many hundred of years ago. But anyway, <clears throat> there is in existence no fragrance that is as good as the fragrance there. Because that is a divine fragrance. It's there without being produced, without being produced, distilled, and extracted. It's just there. It exists. That are next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So whatever perfume you have in the world, whether it costs 700 or 1,000 pounds or 2,000 pounds, 50 year old oud, whatever it may be, musk from the best musk deers in the world, it doesn't make a difference. Now of course, if the author here, the poet, means the physical perfume, then that's clear, that's understandable anyway. Because there are numerous hujjaj, now in this time and age it's very difficult because they've just covered everything up and it's just very difficult. But, by the way, Rome is the opposite of the Saudis. They've preserved everything. Rome is an open-air museum. Wherever you go, you see ruins. The Circus Maximus, the Pantheon, the, the Roman Forum, uh, St. 
Peter's Basilica, this, that, and the other. And you go to the, you go to Mecca, Mukarrama, Medina, Mona, the only thing you see is a masjid and everything else is just hotels. Nothing else. It's just totally the opposite. There's two extremes. Absolutely two extremes. Those guys can't stop putting idols and everything and new things in there and adorning things. With everything from naked uh, people to, you know, the Sistine Chapel is all naked at the top. Right? And that's where the Pope is selected, which is Ajib. The Pope is selected, his election is in the Sistine Chapel. And this Michelangelo, he, for some reason he was irritated by the Pope who told him to do it. He, he painted all of these nude pictures at the top. It's kind of crazy. They've kept it. After he died, as soon as he died, they actually covered some of them up a bit. Gave them some kapre. Sab ko chaddi pehnani hai. Right? So, kuch kuch pehna diya. You know, sab. Some. But otherwise, it's, it's there. So, when you go in there, you can't take pictures because it's supposed to be a place of worship. You have to take your topi off. And, but that's, that's where it is. And that's where the, the, the next pope is chosen. That's where they have their, that's where they have their special worships. And so on and so forth. Very strange dichotomy. I don't know how they reconcile that. It's very strange. But alhamdulillah, for us, it's a recommendation is that the masjid should not have any decoration. So according to the, the, the proper, the, we would have too much. right? But it's not really too much because in one sense, it's kind of, you get used to it. It's not, there's not too many different things. Some, some masjids are overdone. They look tacky, they look weird. Six colors in some masjids. How can you have six colors? It goes against decoration rules. The, the maximum that you can have in design is three colors. Two primary colors and one just for a touch, an additional touch. That's the maximum you have in any design. So there's certain masajid that we have, you know, they have six, seven colors. The, the ceiling is another color, the carpet is totally off. The, the walls have two, three colors. It's ajeeb. There needs to be some elegance in a masjid. Then the one thing that our masajid lack, I went to a bed factory the other day, and I went in and I felt this really, I smelled this really nice smell. I said, where's this coming from? So then they had these special uh, fragrance dispensers. Not, not the, the Glade ones that you buy for the house. The, the, these are industrial ones. A professional industrial. And uh, mashallah, it creates, I mean, we go to these hotels, that's what they have. And I think masajid should definitely have fragrance dispensers. I'm waiting for the first masjid to start it off. Might be this one, inshallah. But it makes a difference. You know, when it's a nice smell in a place, you actually, mazata ita, because the Prophet loved fragrance. He loved fragrance, so why not? It's our deen. If we can spend so much money on decoration in any masjid, then why can't we put fragrance in there? You know, sometimes, somehow we need to be able to figure out how to keep the toilet smell in the toilet and the, the wet sock smell, you know. I think this masjid is okay. Maybe I've just gotten used to it, but I think it's okay. Uh, but this is the challenge of many masajid. How do you deal with the wet socks, wudu khana? And especially as soon as you go in, that's the wudu places there. It's just... Sometimes they use double doors for these kind of things, so that it keeps the smell inside. There are ways to do these things, but you have to, you have to understand that there, there are solutions out there. Because companies have these kind of solutions. But I have to say the Saudis, they do a good job. In terms of cleanliness, they do a good job. You won't see a speck in Masjid Nabawi or the Haram. That they definitely do a good job. Allah reward them for that. So... Numerous hujjaj in the olden days when it was a bit more relaxed and casual down there. In time with the Uthmanis and before, for many, many hundreds of years, it was very casual down there. And they would be close to the Qabr al-Sharif and they would, they, they would be able to s smell this. And this is why Ibn Ajiba mentions that many hujjaj have reported this, this smell. And we also know of many salihin from whose grave, many shuhada, many salihin whose graves have a scent there. Around the world in different places it happens. And especially if you want your grave to smell nice, they say you send a lot of salawat on the Prophet ﷺ during your life. Then just as the Prophet ﷺ is fragrant, you will also become fragrant. In the Prophet ﷺ's life, as we read in the Shama'il, 
he used to constantly have a unique scent. Constantly. Whether he used any perfume or not. So sometimes he would use some perfume, but other time he may have not, but he still had a natural, fragrant odor about him all the time. His perspiration was that. When people perspire, people, people are using... I don't understand how people can use this because it's, I think it's harmful to your body to block your pores by using these antiperspirants. So what you're doing there is you're essentially blocking your pores so that you don't sweat. Sweating is a natural phenomenon. That's what it is. With the Prophet Sallallahu he sweated. There was perspiration and it was good because it was a good smell. The people of Medina recognized that smell. They knew that he'd passed by he would know that. <clears throat> Ibn Ajiba relates from Jabir radiallahu anhu that once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had me behind him on the, on the animal and I kissed the, the seal, of pro, seal of prophethood on his back, the protruding flesh and musk would emanate from my mouth because I did that. Whenever he would shake hands with somebody, he would leave a nice smell, just like somebody who's just, you know, used a nice perfume. It's like that. Whenever he would pass his hands over the head of a child, that child would have a smell about him. You could pick him out among a whole group of children. We read that as well. There's numerous other things mentioned about him in terms of, for example, Allama Suyuti in his Khasais. Which is a book about the specific characteristics of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He mentions certain narrations there. A lot of them are weak, but then they have some really amazing uh, uh, details about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So one of the things he mentions, which Ibn Ajiba mentions as well, is that whenever the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would defecate, the ground would open up and consume it and dispose of it, basically. Where whenever that happened. And they would le- what would be left there would be just a fragrant smell. Now this has not been mentioned by numerous narrators or anything like that. This is just something very specifically mentioned. Allah knows best, but it's not too far-fetched for somebody like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's known that there were sahabi who, and this is sahih, that he drank his blood. That's known. There's, there's also others, other narrations mentioned as well. The other thing is that when the Prophet ﷺ then passed away, when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, none of the, the, the effects of death, aside from the fact that his soul was gone, none of the other effects that make a person look ugly or bad or disfigured or strange in any way appeared on him. That's why Abu Bakr radiallahu when he came, he was just so amazed. He had to say that, Tibta hayyan wa mayyitan. You are so blessed. You are so perfect in both your life state and in your state of departure from this world as well. So, aside from that physical scent of his, the Prophet was a fragrant breeze that constantly, that constantly provided that fragrance to people around him. Because when you are enlightened, you are fragranced. Fragrance make you enlightened if it's a good fragrance. So if you're enlightened, this is what the Prophet ﷺ was doing. He was constantly enlightening people around him. So he was sp- spreading his perfume. So this is in a more metaphorical sense. And today, until today, we are benefiting from this fragrance of his. This entire world has been fragranced. By Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why a poet says, وَلَيْسَ فَتِيتُ الْمِسْكِ مَا تَجِدُونَهُ وَلَكِنَّهُ ذَاكَ الثَّنَاءُ الْمُخَلَّفُ The musk we're talking about with regards to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not the physical musk, but rather it is the praise of him that has been left behind. <clears throat> the next poem then, which starts with the discussion of the Prophet's birth is Abana Mawliduhu Antibi on Surihi Yatiba Mubtada in Minhu wa Muhtatami. So he uses the same concept of Tib, but he uses the word Tib differently. So in the previous poem it was about fragrance, but the word Tib also is from Tayyib, which means to be excellent. 
to be precious, to be beautiful, to be really, really worthy of something. So he says that when the Prophet ﷺ was born, his mawlid, it revealed the purity of his ancestry. It showed that he had come from a very pure ancestry. How fine his origin and how pure his final end. That's what the poet says. So what does this mean? Well, a number of things. Firstly, when the day that he was born, the day of his mawlid, there is a number of major signs, major events that took place around the world. Now since we're using this word mawlid, there's this constant uh, discussion online on online forums, mawlid is halal, mawlid is haram, mawlid is bid'ah, mawlid is that, mawlid is, you know, all that. The thing is that the Deobandis are considered to consider mawlid to be bid'ah. And they do consider some forms of celebrating mawlid to be bid'ah. But the Deobandis actually celebrate the mawlid just like everybody else. That's why you'll see in Rabi Al-Awwal, other ulama will go, they'll have a program on seerah. Right? Around the country, you'll see programs on seerah. If that's not a mawlid, what is it? Right? If that's not a mawlid, what is it? So we do it as well. They sing nazams in there as well. You have naats in there. All the rest of it. It's a mawlid. But it's just they don't do some of the strange things that others may be doing, which are borderline or off limits. So... Whenever somebody asks, do you guys celebrate Mawlid? I said, yes, absolutely, we celebrate the Mawlid. But not the Mawlid that, you know, it depends on how you define Mawlid. So you have to understand that. I remember we went to Syria, we were invited to a wedding in the middle of the year. It's not Rabiul Awal at all. And they said they were going to have a Mawlid. I'm like, what are you going to do with a Mawlid, you know? It's a wedding, they do a Mawlid as well. All that means is that they sing a few Nazams. That's a mawlid. That's what they, in Syria, when they call a mawlid, that's what they call a mawlid. Singing a few nazams about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's a mawlid. Now the problem with some of the mawlids is the fact that they insist that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is present. You know, it, it's a possibility, but they insist he's present and then do strange things. And that This is where the problem comes and then... When you don't stop these things, they go to an extreme sometimes. This is where the issue is. Otherwise, they open these do mawlid. You have all of these. Uh, Rabi Ullah is filled with nazams and nats and uh, programs and things like that. We just don't call it mawlid. We call it a conference. A seerat conference. We should actually just start calling it a mawlid, you know that. Because then you'll understand this is a mawlid, this is a true mawlid. So there were numerous extraordinary things that happened when the Prophet ﷺ was born. Which all indicate that this must have been a very special individual. And special individuals aren't born from anywhere. They're born through a very special, a very special family, ancestry. So that's what he's saying here. So what happened during that time? The mu'jizat that took place at that time... Some of them were very widespread. Some of them were well known by others. Number one, Amina bint Wahab, which was his mother's name, radiyallahu anha. <clears throat> when she first became pregnant, when she first bore him, she was told, it was told to her, that you have just born the Sayyid of this Ummah, the master of this of this ummah, when he is born, then call him Muhammad and make this dua. bil wahidi min sharri kulli hasidin. I seek refuge. I give him in the protection of the one from all the hasidin, all those who are envious. Then name him Muhammad. The other thing that she noticed when he was born is that a light emanated from her. A light that emanated from her, which made the castles or the forts of Busra shine. I've been to Busra, Busra Sham. It's south of Damascus, Nawa, where Imam Nawawi was from. That's, that village is, is also in Busra, it's south of Sham, which is very, very far away. So he says that a light emanated from her, which illuminated the, 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 the forts of Sham, of Busra Sham. 
Another thing that it mentions, and these are things that they noticed in those areas and discovered that something amazing must have happened. Because now if you see some weird lights or whatever, then there's going to be an explanation or it's going to be a UFO. Right? You know, th th it's going to be something. But in those days, what's it going to be? So they, they all picked up on this. And this was amazing. Then the next thing that happened is... So it says that the people of that area, they actually were illuminated. They saw the light and you know, they could suddenly start seeing things at night for, for that moment. The other thing is that when he was born, he was very different from the way other children are born. Because Amina radiallahu anha says that this was a very easy birth. Now, she, he didn't have any other brothers. So why is she saying it's an easy birth? Well, she, you hear it. You sit with women who've, you know, who've, who've given birth, they'll tell you what it, mean, what it is. It's not an easy thing. But she just felt like this was so easy. So, he, so that's how she could compare and say that it was the most easiest birth that anybody could, could have experienced. Because you know, there was just no difficulty whatsoever. When he was born, his head was raised towards the heavens. When he was born, it says that he fell down and he was, his head was raised towards the heavens, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There was a woman, who's, Umm Uthman ibn Abi al-Asi. She noticed some, something strange with the, with the stars when he was born. The Iwan Kisra, it trembled. This arch of Kisra, it trembled. This is the one I, I, I mentioned that there's ruins of it left over in Tasif and in Madain. And the Buhaira Tabariya, the river Tiberius, it dried out. Its water disappeared. The Persian fire became extinguished. And above all, the jinns, they were no longer able to go stand on one another and hear what the angels were saying anymore. They were fired at with shooting stars, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. So some of these things are mentioned in the Quran, others are indicated, while others are mentioned in some ahadith. But if the shayateen are stopped from going up to the heavens and listening, which seems the most amazing thing. I mean, then how difficult is it for Kisra's arch, the arch of Khosros, to, to have cracked and trembled at that time? It also, some of the pillars may have fallen down of the gallery, etc. It's related that there was a group of the Quraysh that were worshipping their idol at that moment. And they were doing some sacrifice. They were offering some sacrifice at the time. When the Prophet ﷺ was born, at that time, they noticed that this idol of theirs just turned upside down, fell on its head. So they first thought it's possible that it fall down once. So they went and they, they found it strange, but then they went and put it back together again. And it fell down again. Now this was really strange. So they put it up again, and then it fell down the third time, and they see... What's wrong with it? Why does it keep falling down? Now they were really taken aback. They said that something must have happened. They knew that whenever strange things like this happened, then some major event must have taken place. So they recognized that. They remembered the date. They remembered which date it was. They, they recorded that. And that was exactly the date that the Prophet ﷺ was born, which was later than uh, they, they made the correspondence afterwards. When he was born... Amina radiallahu anha she sent a messenger to his grandfather because his father had passed away so his grandfather Abdul Muttalib saying to him that we have a son now and come and look at him so Abu Talib uh, Abu Talib came um, and Abu Talib was sent Abu Talib came looked at him and his mother told him what she had seen and all the strange things that had happened during the birth. <coughs> Actually, it wasn't Abu Talib, it was Abdul Muttalib that came. It was Abdul Muttalib that came. And Abdul Muttalib then picked him up and took him. Uh, took him to the Kaaba. And he went there and he began to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he made lots of shukr for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given. Then he came back and gave it to his mom. And then after that, they went to look for a wet nurse 
somebody who could nurse him. The story is famous that Halima Sa'diya radiallahu anha had come from the Banu Sa'd in a group of other women. And she was very poor and she had a very slow she camel that she was riding on and she was constantly getting left behind on their way to Makkah Mukarrama. Others would constantly have to tell her, come on, catch up, catch up, catch up. And it was a drought in that area at that time. They had hardly any food and so on and so forth. She came and at the end of it, all of them had found somebody, children to take. Because, you know, they, they used to come to Makkah, which was a city, cosmopolitan city. That they would take these children to these outlying villages so that they could benefit from the fresh air, learn the language. Because the language more, was more purer in these outside areas. So this was a tradition to give up your infant child for about two years. You know, subhanallah. Really strange for us to do that. But they would do that in those days. Now Halima Sa'diya radiallahu anha, she was offered Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa but nobody, others were offered as well, but they didn't take him because he didn't have a father. And anybody who didn't have a father, then you couldn't expect much gifts to be given to you or repayment for your job. So then everybody turned him down. Halima radiallahu anha, who seems to be the poorest of this group, she couldn't find anybody else. So she thought, you know what, rather than going back empty-handed, let me just pick that child up. And when she picked him up, her animal just started running. And everybody's, ala rislik, ala rislik. Take it easy. What happened to your animal? Where you, you know, you were lagging behind. Now you're going forward. She says, as soon as I put him to my breast, it sprung to him and he could drink as much as he wanted. I couldn't, I wouldn't, I couldn't give you know, my own children so much because we, we were malnourished before that. And then after that, when he got home, just things just turned around for us. We would go, my, our shepherd would go with our animals and they would find enough pasture to eat and they would come back, mashallah, well fed. Everybody would be saying that, where do you, where do you take your animals? They're so well fed. Because the rest couldn't, weren't like that. So she kept him for a while and then after that when it was time to give him back, she went and pleaded that no, I want to take him back again. So Amina radiallahu anha allowed her to do that. But then after that, you know the famous story of the splitting of the chest that took place and then she got scared, she became frightened, she went back to Amina radiallahu anha and she did not want to tell him why. She says, no, I just want to give him back to you. <coughs> Something must have happened. You were so, so uh, avid about taking him the second time around. So now that you bring him back, there must have been something. So then she said that I fear. She says, no, there's no way. You, Amin Adiya was so confident. She said that there's no way you can be fearful of anything happening because of the way what I've seen at, at his birth and so on and so forth. So, that, that story is famous anyway. So what is he saying here that when he was born, it expressed and displayed the pureness of his family? What was that? Ibn Abbas who relates that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has divided all of creation into two. Meaning all of humans into two. Ashabu al-yameen and ashabu shiman The people of the right, the people of the left in terms of the hereafter. He made, he put me into obviously the best of them. And I am the best of the people of the right, of course. Then he made them into two type, into three types. So the Ashab al Yameen will be of three types. The people who will go to the right, who will be survivors, will gain salvation, the believers. He made them into three types Ashab al Maymana, Ashab al Mash'ama, and the Sabiqoon. So those who will go first. So he said, He made me of the Sabiqeen. Those will be the forerunners right ahead of everybody else. Then he made us all into qabail and into tribes. And he made me, he put me into the best of the Arab tribes. Everybody had respect for his tribe. Just the fact that you came from that tribe was a major thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ So he was the atqa wuldi adam. So both in terms of taqwa, he was the highest as well. Because he was the most, 
he had the he was the most god fearing of all of the children of adam alayhi salam wa akramuhum ala allah and thus he was the most noble because allah says i've made you into tribes but the most noble among you is the one who has the most taqwa because the soul allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the most taqwa he's the most noble and the most noble is closest to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he becomes closest to allah even in that sense and then he says that the qaba'il were made into various different and he put me into the best of them because Allah says إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِّرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا In addition, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I want to purify you and make you really, really purified as he mentions in this, in this ayah. It's related from Wafila ibn al-Asqa' radiyallahu anda Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah chose from the children of Ibrahim from the children of Ibrahim, he chose Ismail. From among the children of Ismail, he chose the Banu Kinana, which is uh, further down, it's one of the grandfathers. From the Banu Kinana, he chose the Quraysh. And from the Quraysh, he chose the Banu Hashim. And then from among the Banu Hashim, he chose myself, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So he was like specially selected all the way from the top. Another thing, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu relates that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam, sent him down onto the earth, then who was in his, who was in his loins? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was there. Right? We were all there, but Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was there, his nur was there, that's what they say. So that way, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was also in the Safina to Nuh. He was also in the ship of Nuh alayhi salam. He was also in the ark of Nuh alayhi salam with Nuh alayhi salam. And then when he was thrown into the fire, when his great grandfather was thrown into the fire, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was with him as well because he, he's part of his seed. And then that is, he then says that, ثُمَّ لَمْ يَزَلْ يَنْقُلُنِي مِنَ الْأَصْلَابِ الْكَرِيمَةِ إِلَى الْأَرْحَامِ الطَّاهِرَةِ I was constantly then moved into the loins of these pure individuals down, down, down until I came from parents who had never never come together with unchastity. So the one thing about, can you imagine the importance of chastity and marriage? Is that the Prophet ﷺ, all of his forefathers, none of them ever committed zina. There was kufr in them, there was shirk in them, but there was never zina. Can you see how important that is? Halal. People have lost all sense of that today. All sense of that today. And these are people of Jahiliyyah we're talking about, who have shirk. It says in another version that when Abdullah radiallahu an, when he consummated the marriage with Amina, the nur that was seen on him, it passed to Amina radiallahu an. And then of course, that was expressed when the Prophet sallallahu was actually born. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We'll just end here because it's going to be Adhan. It's Adhan time. Uh, the point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously, to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially for example the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials certificate, which you take 20 short modules and at the end of that inshallah you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind, you can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.